So as far as finding the domain of this function, remember those are the values that can be used for x. There are two things that restrict us at this point. One is square roots. We can only take the square root of a positive number. And the other is dividing by 0. So we'll look at the numerator here. We have that square root. Since that square root, the number inside that square root has to be positive, that's telling us that 3x plus 12 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Now, technically, I shouldn't say it has to be positive. It has to be non-negative. 0 is not considered a positive number. It's non-negative. So then to solve this, we'll subtract the 12. So 3x has to be greater than or equal to negative 12. Now remember, there are times when we have to flip that symbol, that inequality symbol. Even though there's a negative involved there, we're adding and subtracting so we don't have to flip it. If we were multiplying or dividing by a negative, that's when we have to flip that inequality. Now we divide by 3. We're dividing by a positive 3, so we don't have to flip it. So x has to be greater than a negative 4. So that's our first restriction on the domain. Next, we deal with the denominator. We cannot divide by 0. We cannot have 0 in the denominator. So x squared minus 7x plus 12 cannot equal 0. So what we have to do is figure out what would make it equal 0 and then exclude those values. So let's set it equal to 0 and figure out what values would do that. And we're going to factor. So this is going to be just x minus 3 and x minus 4. And I'm going to skip some algebra here, but x minus 3 can't equal 0. x minus 4 can't equal 0. So that means x cannot equal 3 and x cannot equal positive 4. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so now it's a matter of expressing them first in set notation. So in set notation, this is all values of x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 4 and x is not equal to 3, and x is not equal to 4. So that's the set notation. Putting it into interval notation, we have to look at the smallest value it can possibly take on and work our way up from there. Well, it cannot be less than negative 4. It includes the negative 4, though it's greater than or equal to negative 4. What type of a bracket are we going to use on the, the beginning of that first interval? Square. Very good. So it's a square bracket starting at negative 4. What's that going to go up to? Three. Round or square? Round, because it goes up to 3, but it does not include 3. Then we use u or and to show that we're going with the next interval, which is going to start at 3 again. Round bracket saying we don't include 3. And that one's going to go up to what value? 4, round or square? Round again to say that the 4 is not included. Union with one last interval. This is round, and where do, what does it go? What's the interval here? From what to what? Perfect. 4 to infinity. And on infinity, we always use a round bracket on infinity. So that's our interval notation. Any questions on those? Okay. So that interval notation is very, it's a nice short way, saves a lot of writing over having to write it out in that set notation. As far as defining um, 
domains like that. Also, when we did our inequalities, when we solved inequalities, you know, things like 13 minus 2x is less than or equal to, let's make it 5. You know, when we solve that, what did we have to do? What's our first step? We subtract 13, just like solving an equation. So we have negative 2x is less than or equal to 5 minus 13 is a negative 8. What's the next step? Okay. Perfect. We divide by negative 2, and since we divided by a negative, we have to remember to flip the sign. So x is greater than or equal to a positive 4. Now, in some elementary algebra classes, they accept that. But technically, this should be stated as all values of x such that x is greater than or equal to 4. Or in our interval notation, we could say 4 greater than means it goes to infinity. A round bracket on infinity on the square rounder, on four rounder square. Square. I kind of gave it away there, but it's or equal to, so it's square. It's, we could remember the term we used was inclusive. It includes the four, so it's square. So then our next step today, we want to take a look at the range. The range of a function um, can be tricky to figure out, but generally it's simpler to do. If we have something like y equals x squared minus 3, which is a function, if we go to graph that, It's going to look like this. The domain of that function, are there any values that are restricted here that we cannot get as solutions for that? Or that we can't put in for x, I should say? No, the, the domain, we can put in any value for x that we want. So that domain is negative infinity positive infinity, or all values of x such that x is a real number. The range, however, does have a limit. Remember, the range are those output values for y that come out as y. And in here, what is the limit on the range? Negative 3. Negative 3, very good. The y value can never be smaller than negative 3. So on the range, can it equal negative 3? Yes, it can. Yeah. Yep. So it's a square bracket at negative 3 to positive infinity is the range. Some functions are hard to gauge. If we looked at a function like this, we don't know exactly what the, the domain and range are there because we don't have the equation. But we can assume that the domain could keep on going in both directions. But if we limit it, if we give you a limit on the domain, let's say this is negative 15 and positive 15, and we say that that's what our domain is going to be limited to, on the domain... of negative 15 to positive 15, what is the range of this? 
Well, the smallest value it takes on is, count them out, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's negative 10. What's the largest value it takes on? 4. 4. Does it reach those values? It does. So it's a square bracket. It goes, the range is from negative 10 to positive 4. And those values are included. It actually touches those values. We talked briefly about asymptotes at one point. So we might have asymptotes on a graph that looks something like this. If I tell you that horizontal line in gray is y equals 2 and the vertical line is x equals 5, the domain here has one number excluded from it. Which one is it? Goes from negative infinity up to, is the domain the x or the y? Domain is the x value. And the number that's excluded from the x values is the 5. 5, perfect. So that goes from negative infinity up to 5, unioned with, combined with, negative 5, or sorry, not negative 5, positive 5, up to positive infinity. That's our domain. Our range is going to look similar, only it's a different number that's excluded. What's our range going to look like? Negative infinity to 2 and 2 to infinity. Perfect. Negative infinity to 2 and then 2 to positive infinity. And that's it. That's saying the 2 is excluded. My handwriting is horrible today. I apologize for that. Let's talk about piecewise functions. You know, we've talked about functions being able to be expressed in different ways, mappings, tables, ordered pairs, if they're what we call finite functions. In other words, they have a limited number of, of domain and range values. Or if they're infinite, they would be listed as either an equation or a graph. Well, there are some functions that we run into that can't be summed up with a single equation. So in many cases, we break those down into what's called a piecewise function. A piecewise function is probably easiest to start defining if we look at its graph. If we look at the graph of a piecewise function, it might be something that looks like this. A line going up to that point, let's say that point there is, oh, let's call that 4, 2. And from that point, it's part of a parabola. Easy to do on a graph, but if I needed to define that with an equation, I can't do it with just a single equation. I would have to define this piece here. I'm going to have to give you that point there as being 0, 1. And then I would define this piece separately with another equation. And I combine those to make what's called a piecewise function. So we might define that as f of x is equal to
the equation for the green line, it has a y-intercept of 0, 1, and it goes between the points 0, 1, and 4, 2. So I can find that slope is 2 minus 1 over 4 minus 0, which is 1 over 4, for a slope of 1 fourth. So that equation is 1 fourth times x plus 1. It has a slope of 1 fourth and a y-intercept of 0, 1, or positive 1. if x is less than or equal to 4. So what that's saying is up until the value of x equals 4, the function is defined by that linear equation. Now this parabola in purple, a little tougher to define. That's actually one of the things we're going to be talking about in our next unit is equations of parabolas like that. We would write that as y equals x minus 4 squared plus 2. So that equation x minus 4 squared plus 2 if x is I cannot say greater than or equal to 4 because equal to is already included up here. This has to be strictly greater than 4. I can't define the value of the function twice at x equals 4. I can only define it once. Even though the value would be the same no matter which definition I used, I can only define it once. So this is the definition of that piecewise function as an equation. I can go the other direction. I might have h of x defined to be negative two-thirds x plus one if x is less than or equal to three. And I might have one-third x minus four if x is greater than 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph each of these. So I'm going to graph this top one in blue. If I'm graphing that, where am I going to start? Zero, one. It's zero, one. my y-intercept. Perfect. From there, what am I going to do? Down two over three. Down two over three. Perfect. So that's my second point. So that line... For well, that part goes through those points. Let's graph this bottom part in green, one third x minus four. Where does that start? Zero negative four. Zero negative four is our y-intercept, and from there it goes up one over three. Perfect. There's the second point for that line. That line goes through like that. Well, obviously, those both of those lines aren't completely in the function. Only pieces of them are. This one only goes up to x less than or equal to 3. That's right here. That would be this point here. So it's just this piece here that's less than or equal to 3 that's in this function. Oops, get back in there. This part here is only in the function for x greater than 3. So starting at 3 going this way is where that's in the function. So I'm going to erase the green and the blue. 
Now we have an issue. These don't meet up, but so I have to define their end conditions. Just like we did when we first did number lines and inequalities, is 3 included in this piece of the equation? Yes, it's x is less than or equal to 3. So I'm going to end that section, that piece of the line, with a solid dot. Is, it in, is 3 included in this piece? No, it can't be included in that piece because it's already in the other piece. That's strictly x is greater than 3. And when we were graphing these on the number line, we indicated that with open dot. So we leave that open dot on the end of that line. So that that tells us both of them approach 3, but 3 is in this top line and not the bottom line. Any questions there? I'm going to have you guys graph one piecewise function here. So P of X is equal to three fourths X plus one if X is less than two. negative one-half x plus five if x is greater than or equal to two. I'll give you a minute to graph that, and then we'll take a look at it. So this first line, if I graph it in blue, is going to start at 1. Then we're going to go up 1, 2, 3, over 1, 2, 3, 4. So our first line goes through those points. Second line in green starts at 5, 0, 5, and it goes down 1 over 2, it goes through those points. Now again, we have to look at our restrictions. This top one is only where x is less than 2, so here's 2. The blue line goes this direction. I'll erase the rest of it. The second one, the green line, is greater than or equal to 2, so from 2 we go this way. Which one includes the 2, the, the green or the blue? Green. The green. So we're going to put a solid dot on that one, open dot on that one. Any questions?
Let's take a look now at finding the equations given the graph. So this point here is the point negative 2 comma 2. So if I'm going to define this piecewise function here, I pick a letter f of x, g of x, h of x, whatever. I've got to find the equation for each of those two pieces. So for the green line here, I have two points that it goes through. What are those two points? Negative 2, 2 is given. What else does it go through? Close. Negative 3, 0. So it is through those two points, we can find a slope. Our slope is going to be found by doing what? Zero minus two and negative three plus two. Yeah, zero minus two and negative three minus a negative two, which gives us negative two over negative one or a slope of two. Now, we still need a y-intercept for that. So I'm going to write that equation, y equals 2x plus b. Then I'm going to use those points to find my y-intercept. It doesn't matter which one I use. I'm going to use the negative 3, 0. So y is 0 when x is, ne x is negative 3. So 2 times negative 3 would be negative 6. And to find b, we add 6. So 6 equals b. The y-intercept equals 6. So that means that green line has an equation. y equals 2 is my slope, so 2x. Positive 6 is my y-intercept, so plus 6. So 2x plus 6. What else do I have to include with that equation? I need a restriction on how far it goes. It goes from negative infinity up to what? X equals negative 2. So it's, the function only has, on those, has those values if X is less than. Do I do less than or less than or equal to? Doesn't matter. So I'll go with less than or equal to. Then for the other part, for the blue line, we've got to do the same thing. What two points do we have for the blue line? We've got the negative 2, 2. What's our second point? Zero, 3. Zero, 3. Perfect. How do we find that slope? Three minus two and zero minus negative two. Good. So that's one over two, or one half is our slope. Now this is one where we got to be careful. 
we already have the y-intercept given because this point has an x-coordinate of 0, 0, 3. So the equation is y equals what? One half x plus three. Slope of one half times x plus the y intercept. And that's when or if x is we had less than or equal to there, so this has to be just greater than two. Now we won't include the y equals in this. I put it in there because that's the way we're used to writing those equations. But the function of x is equal to those pieces. It should be a negative 2. Thank you. x is greater than a negative 2. Thank you. So all skills we've used before are just now put together into one gigantic problem. So let's take a look at another example here. This is the point 3, 1. There's our lines. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes. I'm going to give you about three minutes to find the function, the equations that define that piecewise function. Let's see how you're doing here. So let's look at this green piece here first. What did you get for an equation for that? Two-thirds x minus 1. Perfect. Y-intercept does go through 0, negative 1 here. So that's where the minus 1 comes from. And if you find the slope there, m is going to be 1 minus a negative 1 over 3 minus 0 which does give us the two-thirds slope. If x is, what goes there? Less than or equal to 3. Perfect. Now, as we mentioned before, it doesn't matter whether the equal part goes with the top equation or the bottom equation when they meet at a single point like this, it is just common practice to put it with the top one when that's the case. So the second piece here, what'd you get for an equation for that? Well, our slope is negative 1, so either negative 1x or just negative x. It's going to be a positive y-intercept. Let's look at how we got that negative 1. m equals, this is 3, 1, this is 4, 0. So it would be 0 minus 1 over 4 minus 3, which is a negative 1 over 1, or negative 1. For the y-intercept, y equals negative x plus b. 
Let's put in either one of those points. Y is 0 when X is 4. Well, we solve for B by simply adding 4. So 4 equals B. So that is negative X plus 4. If X is, what goes for the rest of it? Greater than 3. Perfect. Next, I want you guys to try to graph one. Again, G of X equals, oh, let's see here. Let's do negative two-thirds x plus three and one-half x minus four if x is less than or equal to six and here if x is greater than six. I'll give you a minute or so to graph those. So the first piece here we're going to graph negative two-thirds x plus three So we start out at what spot? Zero three. Zero three for our y intercept right here. And from there we go down two, down two over three gives us our second point. We can do it again down two over three gives us another point. We know this gets cut off at 6, so I'm going to stop there. That's the first piece. And the green piece, 1 half x minus 4. Where does that go? Where does that start? Zero, negative 4 is our y-intercept, and from there it goes... Up one over two, and I'm going to keep going. Up one over two, up one over two, right to there. So that line goes in that direction, just like that. Any questions on graphing those? We're going to have you work on one more, and then we're going to move on to a next topic, or the next portion of this topic. Let's look at finding the equations for... this. So this line goes up to 3, and then at that point, it looks like this. This point here is 3, 2. This point here is 3, negative 1. See what you can do to find the equation for that? Of course, in the form of f of x equals... Come up with those piecewise equations. So if we look at this first piece here, what's the equation for that? Is it y equals a third x plus 2 if x is less than or equal to 3? Really close. 1 third x plus... One, good. If x is less than or equal to three. 
And we do have the closed dot on the end of that, so that confirms that it is or equal to. The other piece. What's that one come out to be? One half x minus what? Two point five or two and a half. Good. If x is greater than three, perfect. So why would we ever use a piecewise function? Well, let's look at a situation here. Most cell phones now have data plans that are unlimited or whatever. But the old system was a pay-as-you-go, pay-for-usage. So let's say the cost for, for voice calls is $38.00. the first 40 minutes and $2 per minute after that. So now for me, it's often helpful just to look at what the graph would, would look like in these situations. So if I were doing that, of course, this graph is going to be all positive, and it's going to be a flat line here at $30 up until we get to 40 minutes. And from that point, then it's going to slope up at $2 per minute. is going to be our slope. So in order to define an, an algebraic function for the cost of this, this phone, we have a piecewise function. This first piece here is easy to define. How would we define that piece? Maybe not so easy to define. How would we define it? Yeah, just 30. The value of that function is just 30 if... X is less than 40 or less than or equal to 40. Now this other piece, it goes through this point here, which we already know is 40 comma 30. And we know it has a slope of 2. So we know that has the form of Y equals 2X plus some Y intercept. We just don't know what that y-intercept is at this point. To find it, we use that point. y is 30 when x is 40. And we solve to get b. 2 times 40 is 80. Then we subtract 80. So negative 50 equals B. So this equation, Y equals 2X plus B ends up being Y equals 2X minus 50. So F of X is 2X minus 50 if X is greater than 40. 
So in real life, these piecewise functions do come into play a lot. Okay, so our last little topic here to fill up our last 15 or 20 minutes is we want to look at some common graphs of nonlinear equations. You know, we've seen lines basically start out in that form, y equals x. And we graphed those and looked at what could be done to them. Well, y equals x which is a simple line through the origin going corner to corner across our graph, just like that. We could change the position of those lines by changing the position of the origin. Um, we could change the rotation of the line by changing the slope. If I said y equals 1 half x, still goes to the origin, it's just Half is steep. If we said y equals 1 half x minus 3, it no longer goes to the origin. It moves it down two spots. Still parallel to that green line, still the same slope. It's just shifted down. Well, when we did point slope form of a line, we had things like this. y minus 2 equals 1 half x minus 3, where we subtracted from both the y and the x. That actually looks just like this brown line, only we move the, the values go up or down according to the, the shifts here. Um, this is actually one half slope, but it goes to the point three, two. And it has that one half slope. So notice that subtracting three changes if it's outside the, the parentheses or inside the parentheses. We're going to look at, in this section, in this next piece, what we're going to look at is how do those shifts and, and rotations affect other functions that are not lines? So let's look at some other common functions. One of them is going to take this form. y equals x squared. We know that takes what shape on the graph? A parabola. If we were to graph it, picking values for x and calculating the value for y, let's say I pick negative 3 for x, what's y have to be? Nine. Positive 9. Negative 3 squared is positive 9. So negative 3, 9 is right there. If x is negative 1, y has to be 1. one. So negative 1, 1 is there. How about if x is 0? Zero? 0 again. 0 squared is 0, right? If x is positive 1? Positive 1. Very good. What if x is 3? Positive 9 again. So 3, 9 is right there. So we get the parabola that looks like that. Now on a parabola, there are things similar to our linear equations on our lines. Um, slope. On a line, the slope causes it to rotate. It could get less steep. It could get more steep. Oops, that doesn't look very much more steep. It could get more steep. It could slope down instead of up. On a parabola, the equivalent of a slope is the width. Um, the technical term is called eccentricity. We're not necessarily going to talk about that in this course. If this were 
a full college algebra course rather than intermediate algebra, we would talk about eccentricity and how, what that means. But what basically is is the width. It can get narrower. Notice when it gets narrower, the sides get steeper. So that would be a bigger slope. It could get wider. Notice when it gets wider, the sides get less steep. That would be a smaller slope. What does that symbol mean again? Absolute value, good. What is the absolute value of 5? 5. 5, very good. How about the absolute value of negative 3? Three? 3. 3, good. Absolute value is asking us, how far is this number from 0? Or if we're looking at that vector representation on the number line, what is the length of the vector? regardless of direction. So if I give you the equation, y equals the absolute value of x. I'm going to give you a minute here. Try to sketch out the graph of that. What's a graph look like? Well, if I pick values for x, if x is negative 3, what's y have to be? 3. If x is negative 1, y has to be 1. If x is 0, y is 0. If x is 1, y is 1. And if x is 3, y is 3. So what we have here is a v. It looks like that. We could actually describe this as a piecewise function if we wanted to. y equals the absolute value of x is equivalent to f of x if f of x is defined as y equals negative x if x is less than or equal to 0, and y equals positive x, I should take off the y equals, negative x if x is less than or equal to 0, or just x if x is greater than 0. What that's saying is this piece here is just the piece y equals x, and this is the piece y equals negative x. All absolute value equations have that same v shape to them. Well, let's talk about the slope. If I have a V that looks something like this, the slope of both of those lines has increased. That's a larger slope. If it shrinks down and looks something like this, the slope of both of those lines is decreased. That's a smaller slope. Next, we want to look at y equals the square root of x. Now, there's a restriction on this. x obviously cannot be negative. Well, if x is 0, what's y have to be? 0. zero. If x is 1, what's y have to be? 1. 1. Good. So 1, 1. I'm going to pick numbers that are easy for me. If x is 4, what's y have to be? 
2, good. So 4, 2 is a point. If x is 9, what's y have to be? 3. 3. 9, 3. So we get that curve like that. Now, we know that for square roots, there's also negative values. This really should be 1 or a negative 1. But to make sure, that, then that would make this not a function. So to make this a function, whenever we see the square root symbol for the next couple weeks, we're going to assume it's the positive square root. Otherwise, it would actually say y equals the negative square root of x. Now the slope here is a little trickier. Given it something like this, that's going to actually be a larger slope. And something like this is going to be a smaller slope. Or it's going to be similar to a smaller slope. Remember, these aren't lines, so they don't technically don't have a slope to them. So that's where we're going to pick up tomorrow. Um, we're going to talk about these graphs and different shifts and rotations that can happen to them. And then if there's time tomorrow, we are going to review for test three. Remember, test three, or sorry, test three, test two, I should say, is on Monday, April 8th. Also, Homework, not April 8th, it's April, ah, I have to double check, it is April 8th, sorry. Homework 10B corresponds to the stuff that we have going on today, that we talked about today. Now remember, there still, will still be a quiz for week 10 that will be due on Monday. Um, I'll leave it up to you whether you want to try to do that after you take the testing class Monday or if you want to try to get it done um, before the test. But keep in mind, there is still a quiz this week, even with the test coming up next week. So make sure you plan your time accordingly to make sure you have time to complete that. Any questions? Okay, that's all we have for today. So we will see you all tomorrow. Have a great day.